Great. So what we're going to do tonight is a couple of things. I got one odd announcement, then we'll do a soft side shelter presentation to look at what tent cities are like, like, look like just to get our brain cells going. But the primary product and the thing we're going to focus on is uh, the traditional type of shelter that we think would be spontaneous shelters in our neighborhood. And Kayla's got a draft of something to get us going down that path. And then we'll talk about uh, our appendixes and a COVID you know, pandemic aspect to that. She'll probably cover that. So at the end, there's a kicker at the end. I would like to make sure if anybody would like to be on this team to help Kayla with the uh, drafting of the, the new section to the hub captain book, be ready to put your hand up. And I can tell you, she's got such a great job, a start jump start that it's not gonna be crafting from ground up, it'll be more applying sanity and then talking about if we want to have partners as part of that. So the one thing I want to start with is just kind of breaking news that applies to shelters in a way. Um, Frank made connections uh, to the city because he'd heard about a new tool that they're using and they use it to run simulations of what earthquakes would do. And I don't have the materials here tonight. I'll be showing them at the hub captain meeting and I think Anne might have them at the Northeast whenever we can get them as a speaker. But it's a tool that takes tons of analytical GIS data available and projects scenarios about, you know, what if we had the, the Cascadia 9.0? What hap would happen if we had the Seattle Fault earthquake? And you can actually dive down to the block or neighborhood level to see the projected level of damage to see what your population affected would be, you know, and then what the dis disappropriate inequity factors would be, you know, given the population characteristics of the neighborhood, would you have more seniors affected? Would you have um, underserved communities affected? Would there be pockets of poverty that would be affected? And it's very, very interesting. You, it, I'm not a statistician. I'm going to let her explain all that, but the two things that popped in our minds for using it was, let's make sure our hubs are set up in safe places and not right next to where all the buildings might collapse, you know, that's one. But the other is I would be very interested to look at my neighborhood and go, magically in all these earthquake scenarios, given the buildings in my neighborhood, I'm gonna have no damage. So I might plan on all my resources going to whichever direction the damage is going to happen, right? So you'll just have to wait till we can show that, but it, it would help us really personalize our thinking about what we would do for sheltering in our neighborhoods. So, so I am going to share screens and we'll go to the soft side Indeed. shelter. Is that the uh, one concern that you're talking about? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is, I I'm, I'm, don't want to spill the beans, but this is excerpt from Ian Gallagher is our hub captain at EC Hughes at, here in the Southwest sector. And every year he's been on the security or the emergency services um, team down at Burning Man. And Ann Forrest and I interviewed him and he took us through a much longer presentation because we were going like, what is, what about tent cities? What if people start putting tents in our park? Should we be thinking about um, marking out grids or, you know, like how are these organized? And so this is a couple of slides, about six slides out of his larger presentation that he's going to give at the Communications Academy. So that's why I promised him I wouldn't show all of them, but I pulled out the ones that are related to um, just what's, what's sheltering. So for those who, my brother went to Burning Man the last year, not, they didn't have it last year, but the year that they could do it. And it was amazing, the pictures that came back. And, and so it was really formed around a um, art and, um, environmental, it is, it's almost indescribable. And I'm showing you the super boring pictures. You should go Google man, Google Burning Man and see what the whole party is about. But for our purposes, it's a temporary city that pops up and it's really only there for two weeks. 
Um, it's open to the public and they have campers and people come and go, but there's really zero in this playa. And then the city pops up and then they party and then it goes away. And uh, so people have staffed this for a long time and they really have it down to a science. So it doesn't quite fit our needs around how would I set up a, a tent area in my Morgan Park, but it, you know, it, the principles of camping in in mass are kind of the same but this was really a fun way to demonstrate it so this is what it looks like you know from drone footage and they have no rules about as far as i know no rules about what you come and camp in so there's tents there's people crazy people who might be just in sleeping bags on the sand with a tarp over them it gets really windy and sandy i can't imagine anybody wanting to do that people bring school buses they bring campers my brother bought an RV just so that they had a, a hard side place and a place to make his ice. So I see Frank taking pictures, so I won't move the... <laughs> hey, thank you. But I like, how, I like how they laid it out like a development for access. Yeah, well, and, and so that was kind of the point. We went like, wow, that's pretty dang organized. And he said, yep, that's, you know, the workers get there ahead of time and they grid it out. And I'll show you a little bit more pictures. But this is the whole situation. You know, there's like one road in and one road out and then, you know, 80,000 people. This is what it looks like from straight down. And so there are a couple of things. This is where most of the artwork is done. I mean, it's all around this giant party of this fabulous and unbelievable art installations. And it, it is a regular grid. I have a better picture where you can see where the grid changes a little bit. But the other thing to notice on here is this is sort of like the, the information center. This is where security and communications and centralized services are hosted. And so it is kind of like a logical way where if you need information, you know where to go. This is how big it is. So it is 2.1 miles from the widest part to the widest part. So from South Lake Union all the way down to, you know, the international district is, if you overlaid that on Seattle, that's how big that is. And this, and they call it Black Rock City. I don't know why, but you know, so this is, this is kind of the interesting part. So when we said, well, my God, you know, if it's two miles long, how do you, how do you navigate? And he said, well, they did it pretty logically. It's based on a clock where noon is at the top 10 o'clock, 9.39, you know. So if you're walking this direction and you go, hey, I'm supposed to meet my friend at 6, 6th and D, right? You would trot down to 6 and go into D. So it's ABC through whatever. And each year it changes because they keep adding. And then clock directions so that you can find friends. And then this is where you can actually see where the grid I lose my mouse here, where the grid changes. And I don't know what the difference is between, you know, is this for smaller campers and these are the big people with big parties or, um, and one of the questions we had for him is like, where are the Santa cans? You know, <laughs> I mean, like, and he said, they're, they're specifically laid out and he, and he thinks it's every other, you know, like it, it could be the even ones. He, he didn't know we were going to ask him all these detailed questions. It could be that at 10, 9, 8, and whatever, it's on every other alphabet street. But it's pretty predictable about where you can find certain services. And then again, here's the information center down there. So back to that, that's, that's what it looks like in practice. And so now you can see that there's really no control within those uh, blocks. It's more like keep these aisles clear and we'll all be good. And so uh, my brother, you, you can see where some people have formed little compounds. My brother was with two other people and they just all park side by side, but people like to do little compounds. So they have, you know, a little gathering area in the middle because there's no feeding services. You know, everybody brings your own food and everybody shares everything, but there's no centralized feeding. And other than the bathrooms, you bring your own water and you do all that, your own stuff. So for us, we were thinking, well, we're certainly not going to have people in tents bringing their own, you know, everything that that could be problematic. But that's that's what the soft side shelter people get to work on. This is that little weird center um, where 
information is at a hub so that everybody can come in and get you know what they need to know so that that was a good thing to remember is that if you've got people at a tent area and you're trying to you know keep it managed that might be where you you know put hey cleanup shifts are going to happen at this time or something like that and this is a little bit closer of a shot um, just to see the variety and the thing that struck me about this is oh yeah if people are tent camping they're going to want to have their car nearby because I would, you know, I would be going, well, if it's really raining and I'm freezing, I'm going to get the car and I'm going to run the, run it for 15 minutes and try and warm up. So one of the things that we had not talked about is what are you going to do with all the people who want to bring their cars or their pop-ups and, and be out where they're um, not under trees and, and they've gotten out of their building, but they're afraid to go back in and they just need to park somewhere. And then the last slide I've got is kind of like things to think about. So here's one where it's just massively dense, but those streets were maintained. So how wide would you grid your park to you know, allow people to camp with their families or their neighbors, or, or are you gonna say you get 10 feet and 10 feet and you try and enforce that? This is more like what that looks like. Uh, if you have a lot of spacing, you can get people to separate out and it's not quite such you know, horrible conditions. And then in Christchurch, my, my memory of Christchurch was as soon as they, they realized that all the pipes had broken and the neighborhoods were not going to have sewage treatment at all, they made a run on the entire world market of porta potties and shipped them in. So that, that's one of those things that we would end up, and we've practiced this in the drills. Hey, we have 50 people gathering in the park and they're all afraid to go back in their house and sanitation is going to be a problem here, pretty quick city. Do you think you could, you know, start scavenging those uh, porta potties and get them out here, Frank? You got to unmute. Uh, the camel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, <Pasa. laughs> It is. You, you just won't believe it is. I would love to go, except it's hot and sweaty and a bunch of, you know, way, way too many drunk people that I want to be around. But I mean, it looks fabulous. So I keep I want my brother to go back and so I can just drop in for the day or something. The other thing about this picture is look at how they enforced the grid. You know, mm -hmm. there are actually flags that help delineate, you know, and so that is a question if you're if you we think that we can give someone an instruction sheet like a Boy Scout troop and say, you know, we know there's going to be a lot of building damage. We're expecting people to show up in the park, go grid this off, you know, and give them a diagram of however we want them to do it. You know, all we're going to have at the time is, you know, spray paint maybe or yellow tape, but this, you know, you know, just using poles that people it look like generally tend to respect since those lines were very clearly demarked as you looked along it. So that's that's kind of my before I stop sharing anybody want me to go back and show anything else Cindy just a quick thing um so you're when you're asking about how they enforce they do actually have a security force they have people who are called the enforcers oh. um, so so they do actually and they're all volunteer based so they do yeah. actually have a volunteer security um that yeah. helps maintain order yeah, he, that's what he, the rest of his thing is on communications and secu security dispatch and the firefighters and stuff. So that's our problem as hubs is like, we're going to be running the hub. You're going to be handing this to someone and you're going to hope them, hope that they can at least get it set up. But I don't know how we could plan for enforcement. You know, it's more like make it really clear and obvious so that it's a, is that an arm leg sticking up from you, Erica? That's a tail. I get it. It's a tail. Somebody <laughs> wanted to join. Okay. I, I can't figure out the um, raising hand here, but I do want to clarify it's called Rangers, not Enforcers. It's a very okay, neutral Rangers. term. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, Have you, you been, saw that on the first slide. I've been. It's been 15 years. I was a Ranger the last time I was there. So, that's oh, I yeah. I, um, yeah. And they do have lo local law enforcement there as well. So, it's not completely anarchist, but they do have <laughs> enforcers. They're just called police and they're brought in when things get really bad. Yeah. Yeah. So Frank? Yeah, I do have a question about that inner circle that you showed um, that, that um, yeah, right there. Um, the people who are inside that inner circle, is, is there any kind of administrative structure there or if- Yeah, I did not show those said, slides. Ian will show those in his thing, right? Okay. 
because because they really are organized and have emergency services and communications and stuff. Right. So Thank you. I didn't want to spill his beans. So, okay. Okay. So I will stop sharing. And then, so that was just kind of like, I wanted to get that out of my system because he, it was so interesting. And, and we're going to go back to talking about our regular spontaneous shelters in churches in gyms and bowling alleys and, you know, whoever's got ground, that we can put people under shelter, but there's been the thought that they might end up in parks. And is there anything we can help to do to facilitate an orderly setup until the parks department can get there and really, you know, set things up the way they want to? So, so I'm going to turn it then over to Erica. Excuse me, not Erica. Sorry about that. I'm on one meeting ago to Kayla. Um, were you going to share that document, Kayla? I thought you were going to share that. Okay, I'm ready to I, share it. Go ahead. So um, what we had that I showed last time was the three checklists that we had, you know, hey, if you're going to set up a shelter, here's the things you should check your building for to make sure you're ready to open. Um, for your operations, you know, you should think about these things like accessibility and um, rules that you're going to put in place, you know, just so that somebody kind of starts grasping the, oh, am I going to have men and women together or what? And then the third form that's in our, our shelter toolkit right now is the form that Jill Watson was uh, very interested in making sure that people were signed in to a, a shelter so that the city can more quickly go, how many people are at church A and we send a runner over to church A and go, how many you got now? Because that's part of her responsibility to go, I got a spontaneous shelter with 10 people and we're gonna need to add those to the real shelter we get set up and I need to start ordering food for those people. So it's all part of the, you know, managing what's going on in, your, in the local shelters will help the city have a faster, better, better response for their own, you know, Red Cross or professionally run shelters. So let me let me just get the document open first. Okay. So I've got I've got one that's got not at least all the marking on it, but I've at least got the uh, track changes accepted. So let me share my screen now. So Kayla has been uh, working on, we heard two things from our last meeting. Uh, Deborah Widmer is starting to do a regional mass care sheltering plan. And Kayla talked about the plan she was working on with Renton. And so it was sort of like, do you think you could, you know, take, take what you're doing for the, the full up professional shelters and skinny it down to what we might just hand a church? So Kayla, I'll let you cover the different parts of what you've got here. Okay. Well, you'll have to drive for me because I can't. Uh, yep, I know. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, like Cindy said, um, I just completed a project for the city of Renton. Um, and apparently, it's quite popular because I'm presenting to all of King County on it this Thursday. But uh, she did ask me to take some of those things and pare it down. And so, what we came up with was maybe like a five to six page document of some of the best practices, some of the things to consider. Um, and it's written in a way that uh, it hopefully jogs um, some memory of a recognition of, oh yeah, I need to do that. So when, who was it? The Legion, Legion something? Amer our West that? Seattle American Legion. The West Seattle American Legion opens up and then realizes in hour eight that they actually need to feed people. Um, if they had read this document ahead of time, they would go, oh yeah, I need to feed people or have some expectations around um, feeding people. So I'll think about that before I open my shelter. So yeah. this is all really just um, things to think about, things to do before you even open your shelter, and then also how to operate your shelter. So this is the facility inspection and other considerations, like I said, prior to establishing your shelter. Um, I broke it out into a um, 
into a table format. So it's pretty easy to read. You can find exactly what you're looking for. Um, so if you don't need to know about the type of shelter accommodations and you can skip past that, right? And go straight on to something else. Um, so that's this first table here. So you can see we've got type of accommodations, shelter safety, staffing, um, feeding, all of that, all the things to consider, the messaging that you need to have up front um, with, you know, linking up with the hubs and telling them, okay, I'm going to open this place up, but I need people to bring X, Y, and Z, or they're responsible for X, Y, and Z at the shelter. Or I'm only going to be open overnight from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Yep. Um, and so it helps them work with us as well in getting the information out there. Um, so then we have another table about preparing your shelter space. So once you figure out all the things you need to know before you even open, now you need to set up your shelter. Um, and there's a few different areas. There's actually a lot more than what's listed here, um, but we went through uh, looking at all of this under the assumption and through the lens that this was going to go to a church or a bowling alley or some private business. And so um, thinking about they might just have one large room um, or they might be the Mormon church that, you know, is giant and has a gym and a hundred different rooms for people to be in um, or a smaller church with only two or three rooms. So this is the different ways to lay these things out. And we tried to make it clear that, uh, you know, you just do what you can. Um, so if you don't have a kitchen at your ACE hardware, then don't worry about feeding people, right? Um, so the document tries to capture any type of, uh, like I said, business or, or church that may want to open up. And then this is just kind of a do what you can. So if you don't have a children's area, then don't, then don't worry about it. Right. Yeah. Or if uh, you said, I'm going to shelter men only, you know, then skip, 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 you know? Right. Yep. So then the next table or then is, uh, the signage component. Um, so you need a lot of both internal and external signage is just as a way of, of uh, communicating as well as some guidelines on um, signage accessibility, um, at least for uh, people with um, disability and others with uh, access and functional needs. So for example, ensuring that the bottom of the text is 40 to 70 inches off the ground is a, is a standard for people with disabilities and access and functional needs. Um, and then just other signs. I mean, it can literally be right on a piece of paper with marker meal times or at 6 a.m. noon and five, right? It doesn't have to be anything super complex. Um, and then as well as signage on, you know, if people wandering in the neighborhood, uh, they need to know where to go. So a giant sign outside that says we're open to shelter would be nice. Um, and then we have the operating your shelter. So that's all the things you have to do once you open. So the, the, the last few were before you consider opening, now you've decided to open. So here's what you've got to do to get ready to open. And now you're open. So here's the things you need to do to operate the shelter. So, you know, uh, registering people, getting their names and information so we can turn it over to the city or track them, um, sleeping, janitorial, and the like. There's more down below, I think. Having meetings or at least telling people where they can go to get information um, or work with the hub to get updated information and then share it out to a wider audience in the shelter meetings. Um, again, it kind of mirrors everything above. So you have your your everything that was in your considerations or your setup is down below and operating. So shelter, safety and security, feeding, et cetera. I think that's about the end of the document. We added yep. some feeding guidelines uh, more in depth down here at the bottom. Um, yeah, I mean, y'all can, we'll Mostly share because Feeding is almost always one of the more complicated things and in, in this, the city's generally freaked out about us poisoning people. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure we, yes, we're trying to make them, make them safe. So, so that's the starting document that we've got for whittling away. And so the other, the other part that goes along with this this time is 
because we just had three checklists last time. We never really test drove those on anyone. I mean, I think I took him to my one of my churches and just said, what do you think about this? And he's like, oh, this would be great. But, you know, the, you know, you could just see him go, I'm happy to have something, whatever it is. And so I, and it's kind of self-interested because my, the West Seattle Legion who sets up warming centers, that's, you know, they really set up on snow. He'll probably set up this week. This will be his third time around. And the first time it was a cluster. I mean, he, he, he was the only guy and he didn't have a second shift. And, and I ended up do, spelling him for a couple hours because he said, I forgot to get anybody to come in behind me. And I said, well, go home and, you know, get some food or something. So then he, and then the second time it was like, he's putting out calls for cots after he had people in there. And I'm like, didn't you learn last time, you know, don't open unless you're ready for the people. And that's just not how they think. And so I would love to give this to him and go, do you think this would help you, you know, be a little more prepared and, and be less frustrated trying to round up cots when it's snowing? So I would like to, you know, engage a community partner and say, I have two, I've got, one's the Salvation Army here, I've got the American Legion, they, they approach stuff completely different because one's a religious entity and the other one is more like a, a volunteer. And I'd love to find someone who's got a business I mean, I'm not kidding about the bowling alley either. I mean, we've got a bowling alley right in the heart of our most um, densely populated area here in West Seattle and give them this and say, do you think, you know, would you like to look this over? And does this make any sense? Does, is it in English enough for you to kind of like, maybe think about it a little bit beforehand, but if, if nothing, you could do this for us in a disaster. So, uh, so the next thing is to ask people who would like to work on this. And you, one of two things, one is you want to work on the words and get the appendix cleaned up and there's a COVID appendix. And then later we'll do the soft side shelter. But there's also, even if you didn't want to do the wordsmithing, do you have a partner who you would like to engage in this work group as a, as a you know, test bunny, I guess is the right word. So any questions for Kayla then? Well, I've got this up before I close it down. I mean, it's, it's really well done. It's just, I, it'll just be, we're so buried in sheltering, you know, is it gonna be overwhelming to some guy, you know? Okay. So who would like to be on this committee? Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> Gabrielle. I know Anne is still on. She yeah, Gabrielle. Won. And I'm, I'm, I'd be able to help more on the writing, thinking, organizing part. I don't think I have a partner right in my area that I would know. But we could put something on next door and see if we found somebody we could test it out with, if, if it came to that, if we didn't have some other partner. Well, what about the uh, place where your hub is located anyway? Well, since that is the hospital, they are going to have first dibs oh, yeah, on yeah, using yeah. that space for whatever it is. Although yeah. that's a great idea. I thought of that too, and then I stopped myself. So, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Cindy, put me down. This is Ann. Oh, I, and, you were already down, if nothing, for the soft side shelter one. Yeah, exactly. Nobody else. Tom, what about the uh, church, the Epiphany Church? Um, I haven't, I haven't gotten anything out. Um, I worked on that lately, so I have to check in with it. I know that well, they I mean, said that they would be willing to do something like that, but we have no organization around it. Well, no, I know that, but that's the whole point. You know, it would be like, hey, if I came up and it was a disaster and I handed you this five pages, do you think you is this, could you set up a shelter using this, right? That's really, it's just really having them look at the instructions and go, one of two things, holy crap, this scares me and I'm not opening a shelter, in which case maybe we back that a little to just checklist or they go, yes, this is exactly what we need. And, you know, I know the, I don't know what they're called in different churches, but the hostessing committee, you know, they'd be the ones I could give this to and they'd have this thing set up in minutes, you know. That's, that's what we're looking for. It's just the, 
Does this make sense to you? So Tom, if you, if you uh, are interested in, in getting them involved, let us know. Yeah, I'll definitely, definitely talk to it with the one person I've talked to the facilities person, but we got to get a greater number of people involved. Okay. Anybody hey, else? Uh -huh, Louise? <clears throat> if you're just looking for somebody to test drive it, the pastor of the church that houses our shelter has worked in disaster prep and is very supportive of us. So if you, I'm more than happy to share that with them and get input on the feasibility of function. Is that Dave Baylor? It's Robert Bikey. Robert Bikey. Oh, great. Yeah, I would. Or Becky, I'm not sure. But yeah, something. the Salvation Army guy, I don't know if he's done a shelter, but he works with people who do shelters. And so this will be interesting. Yeah, cool. Okay, so, so, so I, Kayla has offered to run this. And so I'm writing down the names so that she can set up a time to talk with you guys and go over this and okay uh, we'll walk our way through it okay anybody else um i'm going to reach out to uh people in the southeast i would really like to in involve a cultural institution you know like maybe a buddhist temple or something like that just to see if there's something different about how they would approach it gabrielle no, I don't know somebody, but that's a good idea. Okay. We, through the VOAD, there's that Buddhist temple uh, group in Bellevue that we yeah, might be able to ask. But you know who I just thought of is um, Carolyn Stevens. She's the hub captain for the, you know, the Buddhist temple up on Beacon Hill. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather stick internal than, than pull in VOAD people while we're just building it, so. Sure. Okay. So think about, you know, think about other places. So that's that to me is like, I, I kind of go through my neighborhood and I think of the people who've said, well, I could probably put 10 people in, you know, I'm, I might find one of those guys and go, does this blow your brains up? Or, you know, you know, you'd really only just do these two boxes in here. Is this gonna be okay for you, so. And then the other thing that we'll have to do with this is uh, after the pandemic work group finishes their work and we know what pandemic guidelines we want to incorporate, we'll come back and, and stitch those into this at some point too. So we're just going to do the, the regular sheltering, get that settled, soft side sheltering, and then pandemic if we're all done by then. We're, we're kind of stalled out waiting for public health to for us to find someone in public health who has the bandwidth to help us review our documents. So um, that is, that was really all I had tonight was just kind of go through the, what are the next steps and get a group going so that we can move forward on this. Well, Cindy, uh -huh. um, let, me, let me talk with Bill Fay because he's the other uh, hub cap here from uh, uh, Central West, uh, Miqua. Um, we have a couple of churches, one that I know has a work, had a working agreement just for shelter only with the Red Cross. Um, and there's Fatima and down in the uh, Central Valley in Magnolia, which is massive. It's got a lot of space. And there's another church, United Church of Christ. But I have, have no contact with those people. So I can talk with the folks and see vis-a-vis -vis contact. If, if we have a document, we can share with them uh, so they understand what we're talking about. And the other piece of it is, um, you know, uh, when you get to the writing part or the wordsmithing, if you want somebody to read through it, I'd be happy to do that, whoever is putting that together. Okay. Well, and I'm voluntolding Margaret. Where's Margaret, my editor? <laughs> we'll use Frank, but I want Margaret to like tear this thing apart and bring it down from like six pages to two. Did she drop off? She was on here. No, she's, she's just on mute. Her mouth is I'm groaning. <laughs> I, you're you're overestimating my ability to cut out it. <laughs> but why do you want to make it shorter? We, it can be really intimidating. You know, you hand it to somebody who might have room for seven people, you know, a family or two, and they just look at it and go. I also tend to be very wordy. So um well maybe you could make 
something that would be for just like if, if you could just house a few people and you could have a first first page for that or something like that if if that's the kind of thing you're you're worried about but i could imagine a big organization a big location like the one cindy was talking about they might be thankful for the detail yeah give them some uh, you know different ideas so well yeah. and maybe the checklist makes sense for you know you know just have something small i agree i think gabrielle that's a good idea that's why I want the users and I want a variety of users. You know, the yeah. bowling alley guy is like, just because he's got a big building doesn't mean he wants to pay any attention to this. And, you know, yes, I'll do it for my neighborhood, but it's got to be super simple, you know? So. Yeah. So, so I, that's the only, that's what I've got is you guys get to formulate, you know, is it a short, short version for small and the more expanded for, you know, if they've got bigger square footage. Cindy, we have um, a number of large buildings that have empty first floors. I mean, it's, they hope, I'm sure it's temporary, but we otherwise don't have any large facilities in Eastlake. And I'm thinking that maybe it'd be worth checking in with one of the building managers um, in one of those big office buildings. Um, Cause Alexandria that owns them is really very community oriented as a developer. Okay. So. I don't, I, I don't mind trying that. Okay. Um, are they commercial spaces that haven't filled up? Oh, e bummer. Okay. Yeah, we have a fair amount. I mean, we all have ideas about what ought to be in there, but. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one it just occurred to me I should go get a hold of is um, Zoe at, she's with the Church of Scientology and they're a hub too, but they do a lot of stuff and I she hasn't been involved lately and it's like hey why don't you take a look at this too but we'll see and I, I, I don't know why she hasn't been participating okay well almost everybody got on the list so thank you for calling in you always know there's always a, a catch sometimes um the, the next deep dive um is a month from now and so I don't know I think what we're going to do is shift out of sheltering as deep dives and put it into the hubcap meeting just like we do with the covid now so it becomes part of a report out so you guys wouldn't you wouldn't have to do anything until the fourth week of march you know have having any, any you know like just what's your status or where you're at and so my next question is i only have a few more topics left in deep dives is there anything any of you are out there just dying to know about that i need to bring in for the next deep dive? The only, Can I just the only thing back up for a second? This is Gabrielle. Yeah. Did you, you, you said the next one was in March, but then it sounded like you were saying you weren't going to have it in March. Is that correct? No. Or did I misunderstand? Um, yeah. In March is both a deep dive and a hub captain meeting. Okay. So they'll both happen. And so Got we'll it. pull this out of a deep dive and move it over to the hub captains because now it's part of an updating the book and normal, right. everybody should know what's going on. Well, Frank? Yeah, Cindy, the, you asked the question, so I'll, I'll ask mine. Um, I know the work that's been done on House Bill uh, 1209, okay, for the Good Samaritan thing. Um, I can see as someone who might be approached with this, you know, package for sheltering, uh, are, do we envision them being protected under that or is this a completely different conversation? It would be protected under that. That's what That's I thought. That's exactly why we went, we went through with this. Okay. Okay. Just thank you. It might We're be. We're halfway done. I'm sorry. I was going to bring up something else. Okay. Kayla? It might be uh, it might be difficult to do, but it would be interesting to know. Um, I mean, we focus a lot on the city. It would be interesting to know what some of our private sectors are doing um, in terms of emergency management. So, for example, Airbnb has an emergency management response where you, they stand up in a disaster and they say, "You can list your homes for free if you have extra space," and you can they waive everything and you just help whoever in need if you have like a mother-in-law basement or an extra room or whatever. So it might be interesting to, I don't know who else has something like that. That's just an example, but it might be interesting to hear about some of the private sector and how that integrates with our community. 
Okay. You and I can talk because I'm going, I have no contacts in the private sector. And even I don't the either. city, yeah, the city doesn't <laughs> it might, either. It might I just mean, be cold calling. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do that, but we, we can talk. I mean, it would be interesting, but I'd like it to fall in my lap rather than I have to go hunt around for it. Yeah. So um, the, the one thing I did hear in another meeting today was that the mayor is really getting, uh, getting ready to push earthquake initiative and preparedness. So they're working with the city departments to make sure that they've got their operational planning in place, but there's gonna be a lot of PR and we sort of got a hint of that. And I didn't really connect the dots when Matt was saying, we're gonna be doing a lot more information about what the city departments are doing. So um, this year is the 20th year, the Nisqually earthquake. So there's gonna be some PR pushing out come out of that. And it's also the 10th year of the uh, big earthquake in Japan. So all of a sudden there's gonna be a lot of messaging about earthquaking and preparedness. And so I'm starting to feel like I better get a whole bunch of you know, messaging prepped so that when you know, the stories start coming out, you guys have material for your newsletters and we have the website kind of updated. I haven't, I haven't touched the website in months. So, so we, you know, if that's true, I may just, you know, call, you know, if there's not an easy way to do a deep dive, I may just call it off next month, but we'll see, we'll see what pops up. So I'll, I'll ponder what Kayla was saying. Um, I, you know, like, when we worked with Starbucks, here's, here's how it sort of goes with businesses. We work with Starbucks. Debbie Getz set up a meeting with us in Starbucks because we were trying to convince them um, back when their, their motto was, gosh, what is it? The third? Third place. Yeah, third place, right? You know, your, your home, your work, and, and Starbucks, you know, and they were all around. Come use our, our Wi-Fi. So we were, I was talking to them and Debbie was helping facilitate discussion of, you know, are you guys going to be prepared to stand up, not your coffee making operations, because that requires water and a whole bunch of other supplies that don't get to them. But can you just tell us that your Wi-Fi's will be available and you'll extend them so that people can stand outside your buildings and use the Wi-Fi, you know, because that's what you're advertising that, you know, you want to be a community member. And they were really excited about that. And then promptly got busy doing something else. I never heard from him again, even after both Debbie and I tried to follow up. So private part, I just don't have good experiences working with private partners with yeah. who have any kind of sustainability. It may be a lost cause. I was just thinking we, somebody a few meetings ago had questions about grocery stores and it's like, well, they all have emergency managers. Can we? No, they do not. At the Safeway? Kroger? Well, I have, thr I have Thriftway. And I went down yeah, and I don't we know have actually tried right, to but... give them an emergency book patterned off other emergency managers. Um, I got a guy to volunteer to, to do their business plan for them for free. And he still wouldn't do it. You know, they're just like, no, nah, it's not going to happen to us. We're not interested. And then here's the one I would love to do is the drugstores. But they're just as impenetrable because the uh, national offices won't return phone calls at all. You know, I've tried that. I've tried going both through the local drugstore guy who every th four months there's a new druggist and, you know. Yeah, it okay. might just, it was just an idea. I mean, we have Bartels here that's local that isn't a national corporation. I don't know. If, I know the one person I know who has some private industry is an emergency manager up in Redmond and she's primarily got the market cornered on some of the cool technology and things people do in a disaster. We could hear about that and they've said they would service this area in a disaster, but I, it was just an idea. Yeah, no, I know. You know, Bartels got sold to Rite Aid. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Rite Aid's the one I couldn't get them to even tell me what they would do in a disaster. The, 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 the druggist just looked at me and went, what are you talking about? No, well, maybe there's something, but he could never find it, you know. So. And I was, I mean, I mentioned the Northwest Health Response Network and they do a lot of community and hospital work. And so maybe someone from there could talk to us about a specific topic or. Yep. yep. No, I'm not, like I'm not flattening you down, but I'm going, oh, give me an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> do hotels ever help out in a community when there's an earthquake? I, 
I don't, I'm not registering I mean, any, but then I didn't ever go looking for them. I'm pretty sure that the city would go to them and ask for help, but they're really looking for places to put the responders more than people. Yeah. Or like dorms. Dorms, yes. In um, the, the one that happened in Hungary or Czechoslovakia, right at the start of pandemic, they put those, everybody who was in the hospital that, that had to evacuate, they put them all up in dorms and then they started putting people in dorms too, which the only reason they could do that is because the dorms were all empty because everybody was out because of the pandemic. It was a COVID, yeah, or summer too would be. Yeah, yeah, so. There's, um, I was just at a meeting and they talked about dorms and colleges and apparently we have to have permission from the state and from the governor to even use the dorms or the university campuses. So, if it's a state, if it's a state run facility or for even private institutions. I, they just said we had, I believe probably state run is my assumption, but Highline Community College was like emphatically nodding their head like, oh yeah, you can't yeah. use us unless, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, um, that was a good idea about the healthcare, uh, um, healthcare coalition. We haven't had them out for like five or six years. So there's a lot of people who don't even know about them. So that's a good idea. Okay. Anybody else, other ideas, send me emails, but if I'm not super motivated <laughs> in March, because health core coalition is probably all caught up on the COVID response. Kayla, did you want to, are you going to try and set up a meeting with people on the line today, or are you going to do a doodle poll? Oh, probably a doodle poll. A doodle poll is probably easier than. Okay. So I've got at least for the people that to contact, even though they might say, Hey, I'm just going to hold off until soft side children or whatever. I got Gabrielle and Louise, Frank, Margaret ended up on there and Cindy. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad it was nice and short, under an hour for a change. That's great. And we will see you in March, it sounds like. Enjoy the snow. Yeah, right. No, no, no. All right. Good night. All right. Good night, bye. everyone. Thanks, Cindy. Okay.